So hello everybody, so I'm Kaz, I work for Butterfly Conservation and I'm here today to talk to you about the wood white butterfly. So it is a very brief introduction and I am by no means an expert but one of my projects um, involves a wood white as one of its priority species. So the structure of um, today's talk is going to be talking to you about why it is a priority, um, the identification and ecology of the species and what we are doing to conserve it. So why is woodwhite a priority? Well, um, concern about the plight of the woodwhite led to the production of a dossier back in 2010. This gave us a snapshot of the species status and um, worryingly um, just about 50 sites were identified for the species. Um, and 13 um, may have already lost their colonies, so um, it was a bit of a cause for concern. So information was gathered from sites throughout the butterflies known range at the time. So for each site, details were provided about the location, the ownership, the current strength of the and the known history of the butterfly on the site, its larval food plants, its main flight periods, any recent land management and um, wood whites in the wider landscape, including any satellite populations. So the sites that were included in the, um, the sites dossier had a, had a map. Um, so that was showing the primary areas where the wood white was found. Um, so the dossier shows that the wood white was mainly found only in four regions of, of England. So the southwest had nine sites, the southeast had eight sites, the West Midlands had uh, 21 sites and the East Midlands had 12. So of the 50 known sites that were included in that dossier, um, like I said, 13 of those appear to have lost their colony. So it really was a priority for us at that point. Uh, so uh, obviously um, wood white is one of our most threatened species. Um, so the conservation status of the, the wood white butterfly, um, um, so within butterfly conservation, our own research and understanding, um, it's classified as a high priority species for conservation. It's a species that's listed in the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act, so the NERC Act of 2006, um, which basically means that um, the public authorities must regard it as uh, a species of principal importance for the purpose of conserving biodiversity. Uh, it's also a UK BAP species, um, so it was identified as being one of the most threatened and requiring conservation under the UK Biodiversity Action Plan. And in the UK um, state of butterf UK butterflies, it was highlighted as one of the fastest declining butterflies in the UK. So you can see there that the occurrence and distribution and the abundance change between 1976 and 2014 um, both of those it declined by nearly 90%, so that's a massive decline. And also more recently, um, occurrence and distribution has changed by 25% between 2005 and 14, and abundance is also down by 18%. So transect data and other recording has also shown that it's been lost from many different locations where and where it is still found. Um, the populations are often small uh, or confined to a very limited area. So the Atlas of UK Butterflies, which was published in 2015, included a distribution map for wood white, which is shown there. So you can see from the dark red dots that there aren't many areas of the country um, with more than 10 sightings recorded. And from the blue dots and circles, you can see where it has been recorded historically, but it's no longer present. Um, so this visually highlights the reduction of the butterfly's range over a relatively short period of time. Um, so factors adversely affecting woodland butterflies. So this is in general. So this chart is taken from the Woodland Management for Butterflies and Moths Guide produced by Butterfly Conservation. And it looks, lists kind of factors adversely affecting woodland butterflies for a range of different priority species. And if we highlight the wood white there in blue, um, we can see that the factors are low diversity of woodland age and structure. So the trees and shrubs being of similar age, lack of clearings of glades and rides. So this typically means um, no light or food plants. Um, and then we've got abrupt woodland edges and woodland fragmentation. So you can see that if we try to address some of these factors for wood white, 
then it will also have a beneficial effect for upper butterflies that have the same issues. So going back to basics, um, in order to be able to conserve a species, um, we need to be able to understand it. And that starts with putting things into context. So as I'm sure many or all of you will know that there are 59 butterfly species that are regularly recorded here in the UK, comprising of 56 regular species and resident species and three species um, that are regular migrants that also breed here. So if I just highlight the whites as part of that there. So this is the white family, the Pyridae. So you can see this is made up of seven species. And so some of which at first glance, without knowing the ecology or behavior of wood white, um, which I'm obviously gonna go into more detail about shortly, um, could be confused with one another. So I haven't got time to go into the differences between similar species as part of this talk. So the focus will be on what makes a wood white a wood white. So, um, oh, I should also mention that there are other wood white species in the UK. So we've got the wood white, the Rial's wood white and the cryptic wood white. So the other two have only recently been discovered and are only found in Ireland. So if you see a wood white in England, you can assume that it's what I'm describing as part of this talk. Um, so these species all share very similar characteristics with the wood white, both in terms of uh, appearance and behaviour, and they're only separated by genital dissection and DNA testing. So that's all I'm going to say on that. We'll focus on um, the wood white that we find in, in, in the UK and in England. So briefly talking about the butterfly's life cycle, um, I'll go into more details about each of these stages shortly, but just as an overview, the eggs are laid in June with the caterpillar out and feeding into August, um, July and August. And it overwinters as a chrysalis, so it spends the majority of its life as a chrysalis. And then the adults emerge in early May and often fly until the end of June. And in some sites, um, they'll experience a second brood in August. So um, focusing on the eggs. So the eggs, um, like that of other whites, are skittle shaped, ribbed and shiny. Um, it's white colour and laid um, singly on the underside of leaves, vetches and trefoils. Well, there's always exceptions to the rules, like you can see there, um, two shown on that picture. Um, the plants are usually chosen um, at the forest edge, uh, uh, typically chosen in shaded situations, uh, and they're shaded between 25 and 50% of the day. And uh, most eggs are laid on east-west rides and often in situations where there's flowering embankments or they're rise between uh, drainage ditches. So looking at the caterpillar, um, the caterpillars hatch um, after about two weeks being an egg. So it's a very um, re relatively short period as an egg for compared to some of the other butterflies. And the fully grown, grown caterpillar is thin, um, pale green um, with a yellow line along each side and a dark green line along the back. Um, it rests by day um, on on, on leaves or the stems of its food plant and it mainly feeds at night so it's nocturnal and um, as caterpillars do they leave a characteristic nibble marks on the edge of the leaves. Um, so you can see from this it's superbly camouflaged and I have never actually seen a, a wood white caterpillar I'm ashamed to say. Um, so they're very well camouflaged um, and they, they feed on the, 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 the tips of the finest shoots um, before working their way down to the plants. And I think there are five instars in total for the caterpillar. So then moving on to the chrysalis. So the larvae, um, they move on to off the food plant and they pupate in the surrounding vegetation. Um, so the chrysalis is um, pale yellowish green with a thin pink line running down each side. So again, finding the chrysalis in the wild is very difficult. Um, as it's, you can see from this, it's camouflage is superb. Um, the easiest way to find it is to, I've been told, I've not done it myself, is to mark where the eggs are laid and revisit the, the area and carefully search for them in the winter. 
um, and you do that because that's when the foliage has died back so in theory it's easier to, to spot them. Um, so obviously they, they, um, they hibernate over winter. So adult identification. So it's the smallest of our white butterflies. I think it's got a wingspan of 42 uh, millimetres and its wings are oval in shape and you can see there its body is relatively short and thin. Um, the upper wings are white with rounded edges and the males have a black mark on the edge of the forewing um, and the undersides are, are white with kind of indistinct grey markings there. So you can see the difference between the male and the female. So the male's got more, more grey markings on the underside. Now the butterfly always rests with its wings close together and so you can't see the upper surfaces of the wings um, unless they're, they're flying. So typically you, you will um, you'll see them at rest like that. Um, obviously, um, food plants are an important factor to consider. So the, um, the caterpillar food plant for the wood wye um, is various different legumes. So commonly um, meadow vetchling, which is what they predominantly feed on in Northamptonshire. But they also feed on bitter vetch, tufted vetch, common bird's foot truffle and greater bird's foot truffle. I think bird's foot truffle is the preferred caterpillar food plant in um, areas of the West Midlands. Um, but notably some of the vetches aren't used like bush vetch and common vetch. Um, so that's the caterpillar food plants but obviously um, food plants for the adults are important so nectar sources for, for both broods. Um, so first brood nectar sources are things like bugle, um, bird's foot trefoil, bitter vetch, greater stitchwort, herd robert and then nectar sources for the second brood in August. So it's sometimes it's slightly different species. So at that time of year, we've got more things like knapweed around. So they'll feed on things like that. So this is a, a video that was put together um, by Judith Barnard, who is a member of the um, Bedfordshire and Northamptonshire branch. And I won't make you watch the whole video, but there's a, um, sorry Judith, I'm gonna skip through if you're watching. I'm going to and highlight a bit at the end. If I get to it, I think it's about. So one of the most distinguishing features um, about the wood boy is its flight. So on sunny mornings, the male will fall back and forth along the wide edges around the clearing in search of the So they don't really stop. So sorry, it's very different to one of, uh, a lot of the other white species. So the wood white, as you can see there, they, they fly um, very relatively low to the ground and they're, they're often described as little white tissue paper. So it's very delicate, very low flying, and it's a very distinguishing feature of wood white. Once you see, you can't really mistake it for anything else. Um, I think one of the, the terms for it is lady of the woods, which is quite a, it's quite a nice term. And the one of the other things, um, which is what I think is one of the, the best features about wood white is, um, and its behavioural feature, is its courting ritual. Um, so I've got a couple of videos to, to show you about this, but it really is um, an amazing spectacle. Um, so I'll see if they will load. So this video, um, again, it was put together by David James, which who is the county recorder for North Ham. So if we just play this now. That works. So the male and female they face each other, and I'll try not to do the actions here, it's quite hard. So the male and female face each other with their wings closed, and you can see there they're intermittently, intermittently flashing their wings, or the male is there. Sometimes the female flashes back. Um, and so at the same time, the male waves his proboscis, and um, he's got white tipped antennae. There's another video coming up as well. So you can see here on the on the right the male with his white tipped antennae um, waving it back and forth and uh, the virgin female will usually respond um, a moment later so that the courtship ritual can be very brief um, 
by lowering her abdomen and curving it forwards and then copulation takes place and I've read um, again I've not observed this but I've read that it can last for about 30 minutes to two hours um, and this is another thing that I discovered whilst preparing this talk that I didn't know about is that if a male encounters a female that has previously mated um, something very odd happens um, the female uh, of almost all other butterfly species have evolved um, uh, rejection signals to make it clear um, that that male to males that they're unreceptive to their advances um, but in the case of wood white females they haven't apparently evolved this kind of no-go um, signal so consequently the the males don't understand that they've been rejected um, so no amount of proboscis whipping or wing flicking um, or any other attempts of stimulating the female will produce any kind of response and the female just sit there and waits for half an hour and then the male eventually gives up which is a, is a, bit, <laughs> a bit of a wasted effort on the male's part there. Um, so moving on to habitat requirements so you can see here obviously we've got food plants um, and broader wide wider ranging habitat requirements so they do, they use discrete habitat areas um, but it's now clear that despite the the name wood white um, that they're not actually confirmed to woodland but they also use uh, a variety of different habitat types and often the strongest commonlies um, are in some non-woodland habitats such as um, just use brickworks or railway sites um, I know in Devon um, they're found on um, undercliffs um, but they they like warmth and shelter um, as a particular requirements and they breed in tall grassland or long scrub um, particularly in shaded um, or edge habitats um, so they also use linear habitats so woodland rides wide size, um, like I said, disused railway lines, um, have all, have, they've all got potential to be utilised by wood whites. So within site diversity is also important. For example, um, early successional habitat, um, like um, unshaded open space with a warm microclimate is needed for early spring emergence and cooler elements for the, the summer emergence. Um, on many habitats, uh, many oh, sorry, many sites, um, early successional habitats for this butterfly required um, largely restricted ride and forest tracks, and so they're heavily reliant on sympathetic ride management. So, um, moving forward, um, all the habitat um, I'll be talking about um, will be relation to, to, to woodland habitat because that's my experience of the butterfly. So looking at butterfly conservation uh, wood white projects, um, we've been involved in many projects targeting the conservation of wood whites and here are just three um, recent examples. So in the West Midlands, because um, it has about 42% of the population, um, one of the things that making the stand for the wood white project did was a reintroduction programme to four sites across Herefordshire, Worcestershire and Shropshire and my colleague Rainer Goddard was the project officer responsible for that. Um, in the south east of England um, there is a new project um, called Saving the Wood White Butterfly in the south east and my colleague Fiona Hayes is the project officer doing that at the moment and um, because about 20% of the wood whites are found in that area so one of the many things that they're going to be doing as part of that project is creating a total of um, three kilometres of new butterfly friendly wildflower strips across the landscape and then you can see my project there in Northamptonshire which is woodland wings so the so woodland wings is a three-year project so it started back in 2017 and is running um, or it's, fi it's finishing this year um, it's funded by the National Lottery Heritage Burns, um, the branch have contributed and also charitable trusts and it's working in part partnership with Forestry England and it's got one project officer me and I spend two days a week on the Woodland Wings project. Um, so the Woodland Wings project um, 
it's got a focus on wood white because it's one of the priority species, but there's lots of other species that are, that are part of that project as well. So you can see here where the project area is. So it covers a landscape known as the Yardley Whittlewood Ridge in Northamptonshire. So it's got a focus on Salsey Forest, Yardley Chase, Bucknell Wood, Hazelbrook Forest and um, Yardley and sorry, Whistley Wood. Um, so as part of the national sites do dossier that I spoke about earlier, it highlighted the importance that Forestry England plays um, in the conservation of woodwipe because 62% of all the remaining Connollys um, that we know about are on land that is owned or managed by Forestry England. So all of the Woodland Wings project sites are Forestry England sites. Um, so woodwipe populations, um, they've got a dynamic relationship with the environment and um, Landscape scale metapopulations are vital for the survival of the small and often isolated populations of woodwhites that we know still exist. Um, so at a landscape level, um, connectivity between patches, um, edge effects, and um, box junctions are important. So this is why the um, in, in the areas that we're focusing on with butterfly conservation, we, we're thinking about things more as well as site basics. Um, landscape scale as well. So local branches and species champion also pay, play a pivotal role in woodwork conservation. So again, probably aware, but um, butterfly conservation has a network of local branches. Um, the Beds and North Hans branch, um, which is what I deal with as part of Woodland Wing, is one of the regional branches um, of butterfly conservation in the UK and so these volunteers they offer a wealth of expertise experience and enthusiasm and they raise awareness for the threats of all butterflies and moths um, and also county recorders um, they, they verify and collect records and many like Dave James in North Hants um, produce annual reports highlighting how species are faring at a local level so on the right hand side there it's not very clear um, but you can see the distribution map that, that Dave produced for Woodwhite in 2019 um, so again this is kind of the best way of us getting up-to-date information about how species are faring at a local level um, and then some branches like the Upper Thames branch, um, they've developed a species champion programme. Um, so this, again, it aims to increase our knowledge about the conservation for our most threatened species like the woodwhite. So we've got Nick Broad there on the left hand side, who's the Upper Thames species champion for, for woodwhite. So surveys, I can't highlight surveys enough. It's um, kind of, it's, it's my major passion. Um, so they play a massively important role in all of this. So going back to basis, basics again, um, I just want to briefly cover why, you know, why bother to monitor butterflies. So very briefly, um, just to say that it assesses how the species are faring, um, we can identify conservation priorities, informs our site management, um, we can evaluate our conservation priorities and assess the wider state of biodiversity. So it's not just about butterflies, it's about everything that's kind of connected and um, monitor climate change impacts. Um, so which ways uh, would white specifically being monitored? Well, um, I know that the, the ones that were introduced in Worcestershire, they weren't monitored by standardised egg time counts, egg laying observations, polar transect walks, um, regular habitat condition assessment, and also casual records. So I'm very pleased to say that um, three of the woodland wing sites are monitored by butterfly transects now. And the gentleman on the left of that picture is our newest recruit. Um, having taken the helm of two um, transects at Salsey Forest and he's there with Doug Goddard who's the branch chair and an avid woodwhite recorder and obviously the transects better enable us to see how our sites compare with the national picture and monitor changes over time in a standardised way um, and also um, I record butterfly so I mentioned casual records there um, Obviously we're, we're in August now, so it's, it's, it's second brood time for woodwhites and a lot of time people, they, they tick them off um, during their first brood, but the second brood tends to get forgotten. 
So even if you're not doing a transect, I would strongly, strongly recommend just send us your casual records um, of Woodwork Butterfly Second Brood right now. And the easiest way you can do that is just downloading the iRecord Butterflies app and then that will be verified by the county recorder and we can get your records that way. And so habitat condition assessments. So I'll just go into a bit more detail about this now. Um, so that I believe this was developed by Dave Green and was first used in the West Midlands site. So this assesses a number of factors um, that you can see um, listed there. So ride clearings and um, food plants uh, on the DeFour scale. So whether the food and nectar plants are dominant, abundant, frequent, occasional or rare. Um, the, the widths of the rides and the edges around the rides and the percentage of direct shade, bracken and scrub cover and the height of the, the vegetation that the, that the wood whites are using. So the picture there I've, I've stolen from one of um, Rona's presentations, um, but that, that shows uh, wood white habitat assessment for Monk's Wood in Worcestershire. So you can see there that um, the, the food plants and, and nectar, um, you can see the, the red there is, are areas that are highly suitable to very suitable to suitable. So it gives us a, a really good indication of, of the habitat suitability. So, so if we know if the habitats are suitable or not, how to actually manage the habitat. Um, so the, the aim really is to maintain um, open sunny areas with and without scrub, lightly shaded, surrounded by trees. Um, and we want to maintain abundant vetches growing um, in a variety of different conditions um, to provide suitable breeding habitats. Um, so we want to ensure that there's tall grass and vegetation zones on the edge of verges and these are cut on rotation. So you can see an example there of kind of rotational cutting and also um, how we would do um, a, a scalloped edge. Um, and the picture there on the, the left hand side is just how we would do coppicing. So again, so coppicing is just where we, we cut small trees to ground level and they're allowed to regrow and cut again on a rotational um, basis. Okay. Skipped ahead. So you can see um, this is part of woodland management works that have been happening as part of the Woodland Wings project. So a lot of the, the rides have been widened um, and this is Salsi Forest. Um, this has mainly been done using a sidearm flail um, as it's the most cost effective way, but um, vegetation has been cut to ground level, um, five metre wide strips adjacent to the rides. Um, and in some cases, the material cut was used for biomass projects, so that reduced the cost further, just made it more cost effective so we could get more done for our money. Um, and it can look extremely dramatic when it's first done and it has been cause for concern for some people. But the vegetation soon grows back very quickly and it's great for reducing shade on wide side edges. So this was before it was done and this was after. So you can see it's a massive difference and that after photo is, is a perfect textbook woodland ride that's suitable for wood whites and a, a wide variety of other species. Um, so I'd just like to briefly, oh, hang on, let's get ahead again. Just like to briefly mention controlling rib melia. So again, this is something that's been happening in the West Midlands. I think that picture there is from Monkswood. Um, so rib melia in some areas has become dominant and outcompeted some of the food plants for the wood white butterfly. Um, so we've not had to do this in Northamptonshire yet, but that picture on the, the right hand side um, I took a couple of weeks ago at Bucknell Wood and you can see there the, the rib melia is, is quite a dominant species there. So it can, we need to really keep an eye on it and then potentially control it if we need to like they have done in other areas. So other species and factors to consider. Um, in Northamptonshire, in the Woodland Wings project, um, one of our other priority species is the black hair streak butterfly. 
Um, so this needs black form. Um, so it lays its eggs and it overwinters as an egg on black form, so on mature black form. Now obviously mature black form can cause shading on right side edges. So the butterfly food plant for the wood white um, can be overshaded and become the areas not suitable for woodwise. So what we've done here, instead of just coppicing black fawn and removing the black hair streak habitat, we've actually laid the, the black fawn. So you can see our volunteers, they're laying the black fawn away from the right side edge. So again, this benefits the black hair streak because the black fawn's retained, but it's also opening up the rinds and allowing more light, uh, light in for the woodwise butterfly. So how can you help? How can you get involved? Um, so obviously volunteer work parties, so butterfly conservation um, run lots of different work parties. Like I said, Forestry England play a massive part in the conservation of woodwork butterflies, so they have their own work parties. Also other NGOs like the Wildlife Trust etc um, will be managing for for, uh, different butterfly species in wood white and surveys like I've already highlighted. Um, so this that, that picture there on the left is me doing a wood white habitat condition survey and you spot the photo bomber there. I, uh, there we go. Um, so whilst I was doing a wood white habitat, habitat condition survey on Monday, a wood white, second breed wood white flew by which I was very happy about. Um, so obviously the other way that you can support us is become a member or um, supporter. Obviously kind of times are hard for everyone at the moment. So any, any way that you can, you can support or help will be much appreciated. Um, so I just want to point out the priority species fact sheet for Woodwhite. So butterfly conservation have produced a range of different fact sheets for our priority species and there is one for wood white that can be downloaded from the butterfly conservation website so it will outline a lot of the things that i've been talking about so it's it's the it's the easiest way to get information um, but if you if you want to go into more depth about um about the life cycle of, of wood white then i can't recommend this book highly enough so this is by peter eccles and it's just out this year and it's got life cycles of all the British butterflies and including wood white. So if you want more information, then this is the place to go. Um, so I just want to end with a kind of personal highlight for me about wood white. So as part of the Woodland Wings project, we it's involving kind of increasing awareness of the butterfly and people engagement. So this is a photo that was taken on one of our guided walks last year and a gentleman there, um, an elderly gentleman there, um, said to me that he'd come there that day to see wood white butterfly because it was the final butterfly on his lifer list. So he needed to tick that butterfly off to have recorded all the UK um, butterflies. So I'm very pleased to say that we did manage to achieve that for him that day so we showed him some wood white so for somebody who works around wood white so like it's easy to become complacent and if you do see them um you're lucky enough to see them on in your area then don't forget how important they are and some people will travel a long way to see them and they are a very special and enigmatic little butterfly so thank you for listening if you would like to get in touch with me uh, like i said my name is kaz temple and um, I can be emailed at castemple at butterflyconservation.org or you can follow me or, or tag me on things on Twitter at ctemplebc. But like I said, it's August, second brood wood whites are out and about now, so please get looking. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much for that, Kaz. If anyone's got any questions, please do pop them in the chat. So remember to send them to me. So that's to Holly. I've got a few in there already. And you can also ask questions by that uh, raise hand feature that I was talking about earlier. Um, I'll just have a look here. So Stephen was asking about the dossier and how widespread was the surveying for it? So it was, um, 
all the known sites where the wood white had been recorded historically were um, were revisited. So, uh, like I said, that uh, there's a network of of local branches within butterfly conservation. So, they were all contacted, and anybody that was involved with wood white were um, were contacted. And so, it, it it is a real kind of national picture, apart from. Northern Ireland and Ireland, which again, like I said, is it's a separate species over there, so we don't worry about that too much as far as um, uh, the things that we're doing in in England go. But but yeah, but that that dossier was produced. Um, it's ten years old now, so um, a, a lot of that information is is out of date. So we do we do need like I keep highlighting the the, the records from from anybody that has recorded any woodwhites because there could be. Um, populations and sites that we just don't know about because they can disperse quite large distances. Okay, so that sort of leads on to another question from Amy. She lives in Northern Ireland, so she was asking, are wood whites found there? But you said that's a separate species. Yes, yes. So, um, so that there are wood whites found there and it was only recently discovered that they are separate to um, to the species that we've got over here. Now, if I get my notes, I will tell you the scientific names. Um, I think it was 2008 that they were finally kind of um, distinguished between the, the wood whites that we've, we've got over here. And that was done by genital dissection. And, and, and so um, they are found there, but they're different to the ones that we, we monitor here. Um, and then more recently, I think it was to you, um, within the past 10 years, that species was then subdivided again through DNA sequencing. So there's two separate species <laughs> in, in Northern Ireland that are, def are different to the one that we've got in England. Okay, right. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Stephen's asking, could you just clarify what was their wingspan? 42 millimetres. Thank you. Uh, Stephen's also asking, how easy is it for wood whites to colonise new sites and move between sites? Well, it's all about um, landscape connectivity. I mean, you'd think for such a fragile, delicate little butterfly, when you see them um, flying around, that they wouldn't be able to disperse um, long distances. But the the males actually, they don't they don't stop. You know, they they they're constantly patrolling up and down so we know that they can 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 keep going and um last year for instance i found a wood white on the edge of a agricultural field that was a good kilometer away from a known wood white site um now that was after a period of, of there was a storm so it kind of been blown away so it was kind of opportunistic that it that had been there but those are the kind of instances where that they all scenarios where they, they might disperse so they, they can they can disperse but they do need stepping stones as well so they might not necessarily need continual suitable habitats so they might be able to jump from suboptimal areas to another but they they can they can disperse one or two kilometers i'd say brilliant thank you uh graham was saying he's based near the forest of dean and he thinks there's a population around there. Do you know of that one? Forest Dean, I'm not I'm not sure because my area is focusing on Northamptonshire. So um, it, it could it could well be that it, it's a known um, population, but again, like I keep saying, that there's a lot of there's a lot of these sites that we just don't know exist um, because the dossier was produced in 2010. So any up-to-date information. So if if you've seen if you've seen some in the areas that we've not highlighted as part of our main project areas, then yeah, just record them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Iona is saying, why, when the habitat isn't that specialist, is the species so confined to certain areas? For example, could it be introduced to the Bleen in Kent, uh, where the heath fritillaries have thrived? Is their habitat not the same slash similar? I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, it, it's, it's like with a lot of species, um, like the Black Hair Street, obviously kind of that, that thrives on black fawn and there's black fawn everywhere, but that's got a very limited geographical range. So there's, there's still quite a lot that we don't know about why certain species are only 
got a very restricted geographical range. Um, I mean, it could be that the wood white historically they were in those areas because the habitat was suitable, but then it's become fragmented. So the small populations um, they died out and they've not been able to produce metapopulations. So even though even if small areas are suitable, if you haven't got a wider landscape to, to support the species, then little satellite populations will eventually go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jenny was asking, how widespread are their populations outside of the UK? Are they rare elsewhere as well? No, well, in, in Europe, um, on the continent, I think there are seven species of, of wood white. Um, they, they aren't as, as much conservation concern in, in mainland Europe. Um, so it, it's one of those things that, you know, maybe with climate change, we might see more here as a result as more things move further north. Um, but yeah, so, it, so it's, it's like a lot of things like great crested newts, they're, they're found all over Europe, but they're still a European protected species because they're, they're rare here. So it's kind of similar for, for woodwind. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sue was asking, if there were no projects mentioned in the southwest, do you know if there's anything going on around Somerset, Devon or Dorset? Well, Butterfly Conservation Head Office is based in Dorset and there is a big population known um, um, in Devon Undercliffs. Um, so that will be monitored, I'm sure, by the local branch. Um, so even if there isn't a specific woodwork project focusing on that area at the moment, it could be that um, that population is, is not a threat in, or um, there is a project in development. Um, so the, the, the projects are highlighted, just the ones that, um, the main projects that are the most recent ones. So it could be that that, pro that population in Devon is, is thriving, so it's not a, as a bigger priority as the other areas for us. Thank you. Um, Sarah was asking, oh, about climate change, you mentioned that. So is that affecting the wood whites in the UK already? Have you seen that or is there? Um, we've not really seen that, but it has got a, the geographical, the edge of its geographical range at the moment is kind of um, Northamptonshire, really. We don't really see many of them further north. So it is something that, that obviously, because it is a priority species than, than other branches and areas, they will be monitoring to see if the wood white does progress north. Um, but it, that again it's one of those kind of you think about the independent variables and you don't know whether that's directly related to climate change or just because the the landscape projects that we've got in a particular area are then kind of enabling species to move north so we'll, we'll see really but it, it's one of those things that um that we're, we're constantly keeping an eye on anyway well thank you and we had another question from sarah when you're talking about um, the habitat management, you mentioned promoting diversity and age structure. And she was just asking, what does that mean? Does that mean different age trees or plants? Or yeah, so in in a woodland, if um, uh, so, a good woodland has different layers to it. So if you had a woodland that was planted and then left, then eventually that wouldn't be very suitable for a, a number of different species because it would become heavily shaded um, and different species like different kind of micro, uh, microclimates. So the different age structure would mean that some areas of the woodland were, were light and bright or shaded and then you, you manage that on a rotational basis and so the rides would be light and bright but then some of the inner habitats would, would, would vary. So um, the, the more structure you have within a woodland, the more diversity that would support. Right. Right. <laughs> um, Sarah was asking, is there any evidence that butterflies are affected by light pollution? I don't know, actually. Um, because of, because of the, the, the butterfly sites that I monitor, you, you, do it, you, you do it during the day and all butterflies fly during the day. So I don't, I don't know if light pollution would be an issue, um, but obviously then as part of their life cycle, there are more, there are but the uh, caterpillars that are active at night. So like I said, that the wood white caterpillar feeds at night. 
so potentially i guess if if, if it was a woodland ride that was heavily lit at night, then the caterpillars could be predated. But again, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that would support that. So I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 that's fair enough. Brilliant. So that's all of the questions done. So thank you, Kaz, for joining us today and taking the time to talk to us. Uh, thank you, everyone else as well, for joining us today. I hope you found that useful. We'll send around um, those links that we've put in the chat in the follow-up email and the recording as well. Um, so yeah, that's all for today. Thank you everyone and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye all. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourselves and say goodbye. <laughs>